see how we can do next week. All right, that's good stuff. Hey, we are, we are closing out a, a series today, a series that we called, we called Spring. And because uh, this is the time of year that really serves as a reminder of what God does in our soul. Right, this, this time of year, uh, things, things come to life. Now, things really came to life yesterday. Man, it got crazy. Uh, 85 degrees uh, in, in uh, early May is, is nice. Now we're kind of settling down back to normal. But we were, we were out here yesterday, um, and there was, there was a group of us who came, and I really appreciate those of you guys who were able to show up. Uh, we, we knocked some projects out because we have, we have property now, which is kind of fun, and we've got to take care of it. And so we were trimming up some trees. And you come up to these trees, and you, you wonder which ones are alive and which ones are dead. Now, two, two months ago, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, right? Because in the middle of winter, everything does seem dead. Life is, life is starting to wake up a little bit, right? Temperatures, temperatures warm, ice thaws, cells start to move within the trees, and then the buds pop and go, don't cut that one, right? Or, or maybe cut all of that one, whatever, whatever it looks like. But this is, this is what goes on in our soul as well, and we, we celebrate this. Spring is a reminder of what God is doing in all of us, bringing new life. And so we have been focused on this for the past three weeks. We've been talking about hope and why we have hope. We, we put that up against the reality of our world. Because this, this world, this world's a beautiful place, right? All kinds of wonderful things happen, but it's also a hard place. We, ex- we experience pain. We experience sorrow. That's our reality. But even in the pain, maybe especially in the pain, there's, there's hope, real hope, because our God is faithful. He shapes us through the difficult things in life, giving birth to something that we're going to talk about today that that God describes as truly glorious. A couple weeks back, we talked about the source of that hope, and we said that the source of our hope is the very greatness of God. And really, what I ask you to do is is actually ponder the greatness of God, and and that's, that's the right time to use that word, and we said that our hope is found in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, the greatness of God. If you put your hope in Jesus, then you have a life that's built on a solid foundation. And that last week, last week uh, we got to witness that lived out. We got, we got to witness hope express through the act of baptism. And it it was so encouraging to know that God is doing things in people's life, people declaring publicly their faith, declaring their faith in Jesus. Now today, I want to ask the question, so now what? What do you do do with this hope? I mean, we, we, we have this incredible gift that's been given to us. He's paved the way through Jesus Christ. He's showering you with hope, even in the hardest of times. And now what? How, how is hope lived out every day of your life? What does that look like now and for all eternity? So let's get into that. So before we go, um, before we get there, let me, let me um, ask you to pray with me. And we'll invite God into our time. So please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, God, we, we thank you for the beauty of this day, God, for the opportunity that we have to come and to gather. God, we thank you for your word, that it is alive. Thank you for the gift of life, for your mercy and for your grace. Thank you for the love that you have for us, Lord. And we ask that in these next moments, God, that you would help clear our minds and just to really focus in on who you are and what you're doing. And, and in that knowledge, God, that you, would, that you would shape us, that you would encourage us, God, that you would compel us to move with you. Praise you, God. All right, so uh, I want to wanna look with you um, at the book of 1 Peter today. So if you have your Bibles, and I encourage you guys, bring your Bibles. We're going to get into your Bible every time that we're together. 
first first Peter. So so uh, it's it's somewhat self-explanatory, but this was written by a guy by the name of Peter. Peter's one of Jesus' disciples, brash, right? Kind of a little trigger fingered, uh, so wonderfully passionate about Jesus. And he's writing this epistle, this this letter. It's more like a sermon. He's writing it to a group of exiles, people who had a home, but now no longer have a home, but they have something even better. They have hope in Christ. And so Peter reminds them of this hope as he reminds us of the reason for the hope that is in us. So we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Verses 3 through 9. And just follow along with me, and I'll, I'll, read, I'll read through this. Just let this just kind of uh, flow out. Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he gave us new birth into a living hope, and we're going to come back to that, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is, into an inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It is reserved in heaven for you, who by God's power are protected through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This brings you great joy, although you may have to suffer for a short time in various trials. Such trials show the proven character of your faith, which is more valuable than gold, gold that is tested by fire even though it is passing away, and will bring praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You have not seen him, but you love him. You do not see him now, but you believe in him. And so you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy because you are attaining the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Right there. So I want to come back to that that, that two-word phrase, living hope. By his great mercy, he gave us new birth into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus. Peter is making an assumption. He, he, he's telling us that, that if you're a Jesus follower, that you have been born again. That you have new life. And he assumes that everyone who has been born again has this living hope within them. So if you're a Jesus follower, you have new life. You're born again. That's how you become a Christian. So if you're a Christian, being born again means that you died to self, right? You died to your sinful nature and you were raised again with Christ. And we saw a picture of that last week in baptism. That's what baptism symbolizes, something that took place already inside of us. Born again into a living hope. So now what? Well, as, as a believer it, and if, if you're not a believer, maybe, maybe you're on the cusp, maybe you're on the outside looking in and you're saying, this might be a good idea, I want, you, I want you to hear this, that there is real hope for you, tangible hope for you, and hopefully the text that we go through today gives you confidence in this. We're also going to discover that not only do we have a foundation for our hope, but we have a hope that has a future aspect to it. There is something coming, but not only is it coming, it's, it's here. And it's for right now. We can expect to experience this hope today. And so Peter, this, this passionate follower of Jesus, the one on whom Jesus said, I will build my church, he wants you to know the foundation of your hope. He wants you to know it so well that, that, that in, in, in a little bit later in his little epistle, he says, I want you to be ready to be able to express the reason that you have hope within you. Why do you have hope within you? Can, can you answer that question? And let's just say that, that, that you walk out of this place and, and there's a, a news truck out there. It's, it's NPR. They're doing a, why should the world have any kind of hope you know, in, in this day and age? And, of course, they come to a church because... Churches of all places should be hopeful people. Maybe they have an answer, and so they come up to you and they stick a microphone in your face and they say, why, why do you have any kind of hope at all? How do you respond to them? And in that moment, what would, what would you say? 
Well, by the end of our time together, I, I hope you actually have an answer for that question. Because as a Jesus follower, you have an answer for that question. What's the basis of your hope? Peter, Peter wants you to know it for your own soul. And he wants you to be able to turn around and to share it with other people in your life. To seize it and to share it. So, so what's the answer to the question? What's the basis of your hope? Well, let's, let's go back to verse 3 together. P- Peter says that God has caused the follower of Jesus to be born again into this living hope. You are born into hope. The hope starts at birth. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't give yourself birth. You didn't create this. This happened to you. God did this. No hope before birth, but in birth you now have hope. And then Peter describes the why of your new birth. And he doesn't, he doesn't hide it. He says, God's great mercy. God's great mercy. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he gave us new birth into a living hope. And then I want you to notice the word through. Through. By his great mercy, he gave us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So let's just put this equation together, right? No resurrection, no new birth. No new birth, no hope. No resurrection, no hope. It all comes together in the person of Jesus. Peter gives us really three statements for the, for, for the basis, the foundation of your hope. You have hope because you were born again. You have hope because of God's great mercy. You have hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want you to, I want you to think for just a moment on the mercy that God has shown you. When you think about your hope and, and new birth resting on, but it, it rests on great mercy. What, what does that do to you? To know that your hope rests on mercy. Not on anything you did, but on, on mercy. Well, my hope is it does a couple things for you. Well, my hope, one, one, I hope it humbles you. Right? There, there's no pride in mercy. Hopefully it humbles you, and hopefully it, it strengthens you. It gives you great confidence. See, mercy, that, that means that there's not a person in this room, there's not a person who's watching right now, there's not a person anywhere who deserves to be born again into that hope. You don't deserve a living hope. It's mercy. So let me bring, let me bring clarity to this idea of mercy. Let, let, let's say... There's, there's a, a neighborhood fundraiser. This, this happens in our community, right? You have, you have kids from the high school, and they're, they're carrying a box of, of chocolate bars. I just want to say something about those chocolate bars. They have gotten increasingly more and more thin over time. Am I right? Right? Maybe you didn't notice. But they still cost two bucks a piece. You just get a lot less chocolate for the two bucks. But, but the kid comes to your door, and, and, and you're moved in that moment. They say, you know what? Uh, if there's a candy bar, it'll cost you two bucks. You, you'll, you'll help us buy uniforms or red, whatever, right? Two bucks for a candy bar. And so you take a candy bar, you give them two bucks. There's no mercy in that, all right? That's just an overpriced transaction, right? That's, that's not mercy, though. But, but let's just say that you took compassion upon this kid and the cause, and, and you say in that moment, you know, I'll take a candy bar, but, but you give the person 20, and you say, you know what, you can keep that. that, that that's mercy. The kid didn't deserve the ex- extra 18, but in that moment, you acted out of generosity, out of mercy. Friends, that's, that's God towards us, but infinitely more. You, you, don't, you don't deserve hope. I don't deserve to be born again. You, you and I, we are, we're simply, we're deficient. This is how Scripture describes us. We are undeserving. This isn't something we made up. This is, this is how God describes us. By great mercy means that we have been born into, into this hope. All your hope and, and new birth are undeserved kindness, which should fill us with this, this great confidence. Because this is done for us. We didn't earn it. We couldn't earn it. It's absolutely free. Our God did that. When you know 
And you know this mercy, it changes everything about you. It changes the way you talk with other people. It changes the way you treat one another. It changes the conversation around the dinner table. It changes the conversation at board meetings, around lockers. It changes everything in worship services where we, we kind of look at everybody else and we say, man, I, I don't deserve this. Right? I don't deserve your friendship. I don't deserve you to be nice to me. I, I don't deserve the sweetness of the time that we have together. I don't deserve a family of believers. I don't deserve life. I don't deserve this, this breath that is in me. Everything I have, everything I have, especially my living hope, is, is a free gift because of God's mercy. Man, it changes everything. Our hope, this faith in something better, it's born out of mercy through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so, so how does that work? How does that affect us? How does a new birth come about through the resurrection? Because the new birth is something that happens in here. And the resurrection is something that, that happened, a real life event that happened some 2,000 years ago. So, so what does he mean? What is, what is Peter talking about? Listen, I want, I want you to catch this. See, when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, when He invades us, He causes us to be born. A new person comes into being. And, and He does this miracle of, of uniting us to Christ. Paul writes this in Romans 6. He says, For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, we will certainly also be united in the likeness of His resurrection. The Holy Spirit does this, does this miracle. He unites us so that the death that Christ experienced is counted now as my death. And in that, my debt is paid in full. My punishment experienced. It's over. I don't have judgment in front of me any longer. In Christ, you don't have judgment in front of you any longer. His death counts for you. You are united in his death, and you are united in his life. The Apostle Paul writes to the Colossian church, he says, My life is hidden with Christ in God, in union with Christ, the, the indestructible life that can never die again. This is yours now. This is our living hope. The new birth is the point where that actually happens. You become united to Christ. His death counts for your death, no more sin. His life counts for yours, so you're with him forever in this indestructible. Think, think that word, right? We don't, we don't know indestructible anymore. But he gives you something indestructible. That is the foundation of your hope. What's the basis of your living hope? It's the mercy of God. Totally undeserved and the resurrection of Jesus, and so that you are caught up into this indestructible life. And, and, and this miracle happens where, where your eyes and your heart are open now to see the glory of Christ. That which you once thought was irrelevant, right? Do you remember the day when you just kind of pushed Jesus away? You thought, you know, it, it's good for somebody, but not necessarily for me. It's one choice among many other choices. It's boring, irrelevant, but now, now you hunger for Christ light because you've been born again so we have a basis for our hope but but what's the future what's the future experience of our hope look with me uh, starting in verse four then we'll kind of channel up to, to seven and eight uh, and just to, just to make this thing flow uh, I'll start in the middle uh, actually start in the middle of three we read, by his, by his great mercy, he gave us new life into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You were given that. That's mercy. That's awesome. That is into an inheritance imperishable. Here it is. This is, this is the future. An inheritance imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Right, this sentence is so good. It is reserved in heaven for you. So That, that word inheritance, that, that implies future. It's, it's coming. 
So to be born again is to have this inheritance secured for you. And then he gives three words to describe that inheritance. And, and all of these words are, are made to, 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 uh, to picture our inheritance as, as durable. It'll be there. It will be there forever. It's, it's imperishable. So you don't have to fear that it's, it's going to, to disappear. It's real. It's there for you. It's unfading. So, so we, don't have, we don't have to fear that, that it's going to fade over time, like, like, that, like that kid's play set out there that, that the sun beats down, and once it was bright pink, and now you can barely tell it has color in it. That's not what our inheritance will be like. It will be unfading, get brighter and brighter as our eyes are, are capable more and more to see the glory and the wonder and the greatness of God. And then, and then thirdly, it's undefiled. There'll be no sinfulness in it, no, no defect in it. There will be nothing to jeopardize its greatness. Your inheritance it will never end. No defect. It will never fade. Well, let's be a little more specific. In verse 7, and this, this is almost too good to be true. Peter writes, such trials show the proven character of your faith, which is much more valuable than gold, gold that is tested by fire even though it is passing away and will bring praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So, so what, what, what's, what's Peter saying uh, about your faith? L- listen to this. The, the comparison is being made between, between proven character, your proven character, your faith, and, and gold, this precious, durable metal. And the image there is that there's, there's a fire. And what, 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 what happens when you, you put gold into into the right temperature, right? And, and what, what Peter is, is picturing here for us is, is gold. We put gold when there's, into fire when there's impurities, when there's, there's dross, and the dross comes to the surface, and the dross burns up. He says, this is your faith. Your, your, your faith is being put into a fire. And friends, you, you've experienced fire. As a church, we've experienced fire. As individuals, you've experienced fire. You've been put through the fire. And what, what does the fire do? Well, it's supposed to make the gold come out pure. That's, that's the picture of your faith. What is it that you have to hope for? Well, there's, there's this inheritance, and it's, it's, un, it's undefiled, it's imperishable, it's unfading. And as you enter into this inheritance, here's, here's what Peter says. Heaven is going to praise you. Paul said this uh, in his letter to the Corinthians. He said, then each will receive recognition or praise from God when you enter into that inheritance. It's not, not even open to question. Heaven is going to, to praise you. Then each will receive recognition, or, or that, that same word can be, uh, can be um, interpreted as, as praise from God. Each one of you receive praise from God. He will bless you. And now it also goes the other way. We get that, right? That, that we're going to praise Him. You won't be the one praising you. You'll be praising God. And what you praise him for is his mercy. And a mercy he's going to say to you, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, it's going to be hard to believe in that moment, but he'll single you out. And he will, he will speak those words over you. And this is almost, almost too good to be true. But if it helps, re- remember what the gold is. What's the gold? The gold is your, your genuine faith, the proven character of your faith being tested with fire. And out the other side of the testing comes the proof of your faith. You walk through the fire. Something, something horrible has happened in your life and you don't really have answers for it. But you continue to pursue God. It threatens your faith. You, you wonder why. You question, where was he? What happened? you hold on 
and, and years later you come out and you're stronger and Christ is more precious and more real to you than he has ever been, that is going to be praised by our God. God is going to smile upon that faith that came through literal hell, that came through the fire and, and didn't cause you to throw God away, which means what's being praised is, is a Christ-exalting faith in you. What do we have to hope for in this, in this living hope? We hope in an inheritance that, that will never let us down. And when, when He comes and He brings us into it, there will be an amazing celebration. And of course, God will be the, the central figure in that celebration as we praise Him for His mercy. But we will look with praising and honoring and glorifying favor upon Him, and He will look upon you. And we've got to say, friends, don't give up. You have a living so we have this foundation of hope. We have an expectant hope, a future inheritance. And that's all great. That's real great. It's, it's so good for us to understand this. But what is it like now to experience hope? What do we do with the hope that is in us? How do we live in hope? We're, we're, a, we're a people who know joy, inexpressible and glorified. This is verse 6. It writes, this brings you great joy. This, this brings you great joy. That, that is in this, this keeping that God does for you. God keeps you. God holds you. In this keeping that God does for you and in this inheritance that God guards for you, we rejoice, in verse 8, with an indescribable and glorious When we're seeing him as we ought. And, and sometimes we don't see God the way we ought to see. I mean, there, there are days where it's really hard to see God. We're not naive. I mean, joys kind of ebb and flow. Some days are pretty intense. Some days are really hard. Others days are a little bit easier. But when we're seeing him as we ought, our joy is inexpressible. It's, it's glorified. We know that we're going to be glorified in the presence of the Father. And, and that reality, the, the, the truth, knowing the truth, the reality streams back to inform our joy as we are being transformed into His image. Our future, what we know is true, changes us in the here and now. Peter writes, though we presently experience sorrow and grief, this brings great joy. Although you may have to suffer for a short time in various trials, there, there is sorrow yet rejoicing. And that's what we have here. These happen simultaneously. You see, the grief, the grief comes into our joy. It, it, makes, it makes joy more difficult, right? More complex. And the moment where, where grief starts to get the upper hand, Joy doesn't, joy doesn't feel much like joy. There, there are tears and, and there's sobbing, but, but, but there it is. In, in a world that's broken, in a world where Jesus is raised from the dead, God is, is merciful and we are born again into a living hope. There will always be joy and sorrow in one's soul. See, what, what most of us try to do is we, we try to carve up our life a little bit. We, 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 we try to keep these two apart. Like I've, I've got good days and I've got bad days. But that's not our reality. Of course, of course you have sad days. I mean, every day. I mean, how, how can every day not have a glimmer of sadness? If, if, you, if you examine what's going on in the world around you, if you simply are praying for your children and what they're having to walk through, there is sadness in every day, but there's also gladness in every day. We have reasons for sadness, but we have even better reasons for gladness. And Peter says that we're to, we're to bring these together. And we can do that. We 
because of, of verse 5. And, and I love this. The verse says that who, and the who is you, who by God's power are protected. You are, you are protected through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This is so cool how, how verses 4 and 5 are, are connected here. I, I, I love this connection. Verse, verse 4 says, there is an inheritance being kept in heaven for you. The inheritance that, that's undefiable, that, that's being kept for you. And the verse 5 says, and you're being kept for it. God is doing that. He is protecting you like that. It's as if God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep your inheritance, and it's never going to fade. It'll, it'll never be defiled, never diminish or go away. And I'm keeping you as well. I am holding you. I'm not letting it depend on you. On your failure or the failure of this inheritance. I am keeping you and keeping it so that your hope is absolutely unshakable. You have a living hope. God did that out of his great mercy. God did that. God gave you new life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's that truth which has come alive in you that compels you to live now differently. Though trials come regularly, your faith being like gold is more mature, it's more pure, it's more powerful on the other side of that trial. Friends, think, think on the foundation of your hope, your sure and guarded inheritance, and rejoice because you are attaining the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls. Rejoice in this indescribable and glorious joy. That's Peter's message for us. What's the reason for the hope that's in you? You have a living hope because God is great in mercy, because Jesus is raised from the dead, because you have been born again into this living hope, which is an inheritance that will never fail you. It will, it will never be defective in any way. So, so friends, so, so church, let's live in that hope. Let's talk in that hope. Let's act out of that hope. Let's engage the world around us with that hope. I believe this to the core of my being, that the church is the hope of the world. The church filled with the Spirit of God, is the hope of the world. Because as the church, your hope is found in God's greatness and mercy. You didn't make this up. And so tell the world of God's great love. I mean, stop, stop bickering about lesser things. Stop putting your hope in things that fade away. You have been made new. Don't go back. Live in that newness. He is guarding you. He is guarding your inheritance. It is sure. He is faithful. So rejoice in that truth with an indescribable and glorious joy. That, my friends, is the doorway to abundant living. Life that's truly life. And that's the life that's been offered to you. So seize it.